Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome our associate pastor, Chris Massengill. Grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. All right, five of them, Pastor. We're doing good here. You guys got to pay better attention than that if you're going to keep up with me today, okay? So how many of you come expecting this morning? More better. Well, wh- I have to ask you, what'd you come expecting? <laughs> Did you come expecting to see a miracle? Yes. Maybe you came here today wanting to hear a word from the Lord. Amen. Maybe you came just to feel His presence. Maybe you came to see His power manifested. Maybe all above. Whatever God's got for us, we're here for that today. We're expecting God to move today, amen? amen. So today we're going to be talking about expectation. And the title of your message today is People of Promise. So I have to ask you, is it okay if I go into some spiritual teaching? Amen. You know, it was really good. I had, you know, a few of my people from the first service said, I was a great message, Pastor, but they're all super spiritual thinkers, you know what I mean? They think on that same wave level as me. I was like, I hope everybody else got it. You know, the thing about a spiritual message is a couple days from now, you'll be doing something, you'll be like, oh, it'll come to you, you'll be like, oh, and Thursday, you'll be like, oh, dude, that's what he was talking about. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sometimes Randy, Randy will share something, and he'll go off somewhere, and then come back, and it'll be Friday the next week, I'll be like, oh, I finally get it, Randy, you're brilliant, <laughs> right? <laughs> Can I tell you that it's not a faith message? Just like anybody else, you know, the faith movement, it's 95% of what they preach is correct and 5% is not. They change it to fit their own agenda. I don't think it's much different than anybody else's doctrine. We kind of all seem to do that. But today it's going to sound like one of those, but it's not going to be one of those when we come to the end. Can you trust me on that? So don't get out and walk out on me because it sounds like a, okay? Now I'm going to tell you today, this is one of three messages. You know how we do it around here. And so I started to prepare a message on the scriptures I'm about to read, and in the middle of that, God kind of gave me a little something-something, and it kind of went a little sideways, so I had to prepare this part of the message in order for you to get the next two. So are you okay with that? I'm not doing that just to get you to come back. I'm telling you the truth now, okay? So you can open your Bible to Psalms 105, 17 through 19. And we're not even going to touch this today. But I've got to start somewhere, amen? amen? So now, I've heard a lot of messages on the biblical character of Joseph. How about you? There's lots of them out there. But you know, I've never seen these three verses come together like I have this time. So I want you to look and see specifically how it is said or how it is written. Psalms 105.17 says, He sent a man before them. Is that a capital H or a small h? So who's the He. God, okay? He sent a man before him, Joseph. I like that dash, Joseph dash, right? Who was sold as a slave. I want you to look how that's laid out. He sent a man before them. Let's say that. He sent a man before them. Who's the he? God. He sent a man before him, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. We're going to talk about that in the near future. Verse 18 says, they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. Is that a capital H or a small h? So who's his? That's Joseph. So it's Joseph's word until the time that Joseph's word, oh, we've got to stay with me, come to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. So you've got to get to the story that we're going to tackle probably in another couple weeks here is that Joseph was given a promise. He'd had a dream. He goes and tells his brother his dream that, you know, I'm going to be reigning and ruling, and you're all going to bow before me, even though I'm the baby. You're all going to bow down before me. And, you know, he was already daddy's favorite. So his brothers kind of copped an attitude, threw him in a pit, and decided, well, I'm going to do that. So I sold him into slavery. But he had a vision, and he had a promise. And we all know the story, how it went through each piece, right? Got to stay with me. He went through all these things. At the end, that vision came to pass. His word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Some of you theologians are like, oh, this is going to be good. I'm going to read through it one more time, then we're going to move on. He sent a man before them, 
Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Now, he is, he is a type and shadow of Jesus. What's a type and shadow, Pastor Chris? He's like a representation of Jesus in the Old Testament, right? They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. But for today, we would like to get this phrase into your spirit so you don't forget it. We are people of promise. Say that. We are people of promise. So, you know, you and I have promises over our lives. There are corporate promises. There are personal promises. They say, who were they? I don't know. They say there's 2,000 promises in your Bible of 1,176 pages. Well, I didn't go to check the 2,000, but I can guarantee you there's 1,000. And the reason I know that, because it was on my heart and I was thinking about it, I went to Bree's house on Thursday to pick up some crabs, and I went and used their bathroom, and on the back of her toilet is a book that says 1,000 Promises of God's Word. So I know that there's at least 1,000 promises because there is a book, right? And they couldn't call it a thousand, if it doesn't, so I can tell you, so that's almost one promise for every day. Now, do you think it was coincidence that I happened to stop by there that night and had to use the bathroom at the same time? I believe that's confrontation, com- confirmation. And it just happened to be that book that was sitting on the back of her toilet. All right, let's get a grip on it, Chris. So concerning the Word of God, we believers are people of promise. Individually, every person that's under the sound of my voice has some kind of promise over your life from God. Something you were designed to do by God to do that nobody else can do except you in this moment of time. Something you were designed by God to do that nobody else can do except you in this moment of time. All of us have a promise. Could be a business, could be finding the right spouse, could be having a child. You know, Marilyn, for years, they told her she couldn't have children, but we prayed for her to have children. Now she's got two children of her own. You know what I mean? God's God's plan did not change for her life due to circumstance that happened to her in her younger age. God's promise still came true. Just saying, that's living proof right there. I can't point out what your specific promise is for your life. I can just simply tell you. God does not create people without purpose. And purpose comes with a promise. God created you with a purpose. He also came with some kind of promise. Because promise is linked and attached to purpose. So now as a New Testament believer, you've got to stay with me here. You and I are not seeking a promised land. A spot. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, which represents the world, bondage, they had been given a promise of the promised land. And as they headed for that promised land, they were looking for a spot. We, as New Testament believers, we are looking for a land of promises. As a New Testament believer, we are people looking for a land of promises. In other words, the dwelling place of God is not just one promise, the spot, but many promises. You need to get that in your spirit today. Are you staying with me? You and I are people of promise. Say that out loud. We are people of promise. And why is that important? That's right, sister. (laughs) This promise is the only thing that gives us reason to continue on. If you don't have promise... You don't have expectations, and if you don't have an expectation, then what happens is you don't have a reason to go on. I can tell you you will never meet a child of God that is more depressed person than those who felt and lost their promise. 
over their life? Why do you think it is every time you come here, I ask, how many you come expecting? You've got to remember, I don't do anything without a raisin, right? If you come expecting. I've been doing this for a long time. 17 years at this church right here. And I've watched people over the years come out of their promise, in and out of their promises. They'd be going in a certain direction, they'd begin to, begin to die on their journey. When expectation dies, backsliding and spiritual death begin to sink in. We are people of promise. If you allow the devil to steal your promise, then what happens is he will also take with it your expectation. And the moment that expectation walks out the door of your life, depression, backsliding, and spiritual death will begin in you. I've seen people that have come with such a call on their lives. There's an anointing on their lives. They come into church. They end up sitting on the front row. They're on fire for God. The devil comes along or circumstances of life come along and all of a sudden they lose sight of their promise. Next thing you know, they're about midsection of the church. The next thing you know, they're at the back section of the church. Then the next thing you know, they're out in the parking lot and we never see them again. They get blindsided. They lose sight of expectation. They begin to backslide. Not just literally, not just spiritually, but literally. They'll go from the front row to the back row to the car, never to see them again. And we'll be like, whatever happened to those people? Can anybody testify with that with me over the years that we've been here? They lost sight of their promise. And lost their expectation. And why would the devil target that area of your life? Because hear me today, the most debilitating condition of human existence is not drug addiction. It's not alcoholism. It's not depression. It's not divorce. As bad as those things are, the most deliberating, debilitating condition of the human existence Watch now. It is unbelief. It's unbelief. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 says without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is God and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You and I have to believe that He is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You are a person of promise. If the devil wants to destroy your life, what he does, he attacks the promise over your life. When he removes the promise or the hope of that promise, that it won't be fulfilled, you lose expectation. And without expectation, when it's gone, backsliding, sin, spiritual death will begin to seep into your life. Before you know it, you'll reach a place of total unbelief. Can I tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I used to have a promise over my life. I used to have a promise to do this or do that, but I don't believe it's there anymore. You need to listen to me today. The Bible says in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. King James Version says, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. In other words, God's not going to change his mind on what he created you to do and to be and anoint you to do. I don't care what it is you've done. I don't care what it is you're going to do. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you're feeling. God is not changing his mind on the purpose and the will for your life from him. God won't change his mind about what he's called you to do. It is without repentance. But the devil has come along to destroy that expectation in you, so you throw that hope away. You're thinking, Pastor, you don't know what I've did. 
I'm morally messed up. Well, can I tell you, an act of immorality does not negate the promise on your life. Maybe you're thinking, I passed the window of my opportunity. The lack of opportunity does not change or negate the promise of God upon your life. Well, pastor, I hooked up with the wrong person. The wrong relationship is not going to kill the promise over your life. Church, if you feel that way, you need to stir that thing up inside you. You need to stir it up. You know why the children of Israel could not enter the promised land? Not because of what they did in Egypt. Not because of what they experienced. Not because of what happened at Marah. They didn't enter the promised land because of the unbelief. Somehow, or another, they knew what God had promised them. He had promised them the promised land of milk of honey, grapes this big, peace, serenity, and somewhere between there, between deliverance, listen to me, somewhere between deliverance and their promise, they lost expectation. And when that happened, unbelief settled in. And because of that, they became the most miserable human existence in the desert that you could ever feel. If you're in a space right now where you feel like you are miserable, that God's not available, that you're just one thing after another, that you just can't see light at the end of the tunnel, maybe you have lost sight of your promise and the expectation. Because God has not changed his mind. Can I go a little deeper? Second Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers, say, I'm a partaker, partaker. of the divine nature. That's okay. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We can get really theological here right now. Now remember, we are people of promise. And if you lose promise, you lose expectation. When expectation is gone, backsliding, sin, and spiritual death begins. Just look at what the Bible says. I'm not trying to make some cute statement. I'm trying to teach you something from the Word of God. 2 Peter 1.4 says, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That you may be partakers of the promise and the expectation and the fulfillment of that promise. That's what keeps you connected to the power of God concerning your promise for your life. That through these you may be partakers, that through these promises you can partake of the divine nature. Then watch. As a result of holding on to the promise, you have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, which means if I lose that expectation, the corruption of this world comes and sets in to the lust of my life. For every action is an equal reaction. So, church, we are people of promise. Can we just say that out loud one more time? We are now concerning your promise. You ready for this? 
that gives access to the power of God that is available for your life. He has already provided for you before you were created concerning your promise. God does not create anything without a purpose. And so if there's a purpose, there is a promise because the two are tied together. Agreement? There is nothing that blesses God more than a person who has faith. In fact, okay, we're going to get crazy on you. Are you ready? John 3, 17 and 18 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, we always quote John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him should not perish. 17 and 18 makes a statement that Jesus didn't come to condemn anybody. Jesus came to save the whole world. How many of you believe that? Amen. All right, most of the middle. Okay. <laughs> I'll do a study. I'll, I'll do, I'll do a, men, a message on that later. <laughs> yes, he came to save the whole world. He wished that none would perish. But here's the problem. If you go to John 3, 13, 14, and 15... It says, do you know why God sent his word, his son, into this world? It tells you because of their unbelief. In other words, Jesus came as a result of people's unbelief, to let them know that he's coming not to condemn you, but to stir up again in you the promise that God has over your life. That's what the Bible teaches in John 3. But we quote all the time John 3, 16. So concerning the promise on your life, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. It says, For all the promises of God in him, capital H, are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. How about you just read that out loud and think about what you're reading. Go ahead. You did much better than the first service. <laughs> did, you put a did you put a bouncing ball on that? So the first service, you need to put a bouncing ball on that because everyone was saying, saying in different places, like, whoa. Every promise God has made over your life is meant to be fulfilled. God has not changed his mind about the promises he's made for us, all of us. We should be happy about that. That God has not changed his mind on the promises he's made over our life. Paul said you need to know. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So what is God's will? Is God's will healing for your life? Yes. Is, his, is prosperity his will for your life? Yes. Is blessing his will for your life? Yes. yes. Deliverance his will for your life? Yes. yes. So all the promises of God, I can go on and on. There's 2,000. They say, I can guarantee you there's 1,000. I should have grabbed that book off the back of that toilet. I could have, I could have, made, two, I could have made four sermons out of this. They're yes and amen. For all the promises of God in him are yes, his part. And in him, amen. Our part. To the glory of God through us. So God can make you a promise. You can say, God, really, is that your will? And God's answer will be, yes. <laughs> I got a brother the other day. He was struggling. He spent about four days in the hospital with some stomach stuff. And he came in. He's struggling from this and struggling from that. And he's in service for Jesus. He, he attends another church, and he's part of ministry and John was there, and I said, you know, John, come here. Let's just pray for brother so-and-so. And so we pray on, we, you know, Lord, anyone, we, we do what we do, okay? We're, we're Pentecostal, so um, we, we pray. And uh, amen. amen. And he leaves. 
And then a couple days go by, and all of a sudden he wakes up at night, and he's got those pains again. He's hurting so bad he can't stand it. He wakes his wife up at 2 o'clock in the morning and says, you've got to take me to the hospital. I think I'm going to die. I can't take it anymore. Take me to the hospital. So he gets in the car, and he gets to the bottom of the driveway, and he looks out. He goes, Lord, can I just call upon that prayer they gave me the other day? Can I just call that prayer in right now? And God said, Yes. <laughs> And the moment he prayed, he said the pain went away. And by the time he got to the hospital, there was no pain at all. And due to lack of faith, doubt, he gets there and he, he went in. They're like, there's nothing wrong with you. He, by that time, I'm just going to leave and go home. Amen. It took two days for him to come in agreement with the prayer that was done that day. <laughs> the promise. The earth has to come in agreement with it. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God says yes, but you got to say amen. amen. Do you know that you could have the greatest promise that has ever been given to a human being concerning the future of your life and God's will over you, and it's yes, and yet you never come into participation with what he said, and you carry that promise and that potential to your grave? The Bible says all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen. He's saying, God has already said yes concerning your promises. And you have to add the amen. You have to come in agreement with him. So what is the amen? The amen is faith. The faith is the amen. And faith doesn't just talk a big talk. It has action to it. So whenever God says something over your life and he says, yes, you have to come along and add the faith to it and say, amen. So be it. Whatever it is you want to do, Lord, I'm game for it. Let's go. I know whatever you got planned for my life is much better than I got planned for it. You know? Amen. amen. That's why we said unbelief is the most miserable condition of the human existence. The lack of ability to believe what God said can really happen over your life. Think about it. Could that be the reason that Jesus said in Luke 18, 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will he really find faith on the earth? God is looking for a group of people at First Assembly God this morning that will say, Amen to what God wants to do in Clear Lake, California. Amen. God has already said yes. We just got to say amen. amen. And amen is the faith part. We talked a couple of weeks ago on believing God, November 1st. I, I started believing God for 100 people saved, baptized, filled with the Spirit. I need you to come along and know that's what God, that's God's will, right? Is that not God's will to say amen and be that part? I ask you to remember the salvation prayer. Just make something up. ABC, get it together. Be ready for when somebody says, I need Jesus. If each one of us today did one in the next year, we got that goal met. Just one. Statistics say that 95% of you will never lead somebody to Christ in your life and your walk with him. That's what it says. And I've been doing this a long time, and it's pretty accurate. Say we're people that promise. Let's go back to that promise. Promises create expectations. You and I are people that promise, and God promised the problem is just because he promised something, it doesn't mean it's going to come to pass. We have to add the amen. Why is that? There we go. I'm just teach you something here today. Ever wonder why God is all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing, and yet God has to come and have you to cooperate with him. 
He's all powerful, all knowing, and yet God has to have you to cooperate with him. If I was God, I would just make you do what I wanted you to do, <laughs> say what I wanted you to say, act how I wanted you to act. But that's not how God does it. That's not how he does it. God created you. Genesis says in 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. He created you like him. That's what scripture says. So what does that mean? Because that's what the word says. You were created in the image and likeness of God. If we take that literally, that means God is bald like me and Pastor Steve. Maybe he's a brunette. Maybe he's blonde. Maybe he's a redhead like David. Maybe he's fat or skinny. You know, I didn't say anybody's name with that one. <laughs> so what does it mean? He's been created, we've been creating his image and likeness. Well, the Bible says in John 4, 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So when we say you're created in the image and likeness of God, we're not talking about your shape or the color of your hair or the lack thereof. We're talking about the essence of who you are, a spirit. Staying with me. Now as a spirit, how many would agree, agree with me that God is sovereign? God is sovereign. The Word says that God is sovereign. Well, Pastor Chris, what does that mean? I have people ask me all the time. I mean, God rules his space, his territory, and his atmosphere. God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, and whyever he wants. He is sovereign. He can do what he wants at any given time because he is sovereign. He rules his space, his territory, and his atmosphere. God is sovereign. Nobody in this room can make God do anything. I don't care how much you pray, how much you cry, how much you complain, how much you give. You can't make God do anything. And if you think you can, then we'll just grab somebody out here that's sick and we'll bring them up here and you can pray and heal them right here in front of us and we'll watch. If you can make God heal that person, cool, we're going to watch. You can't make God do anything. I'm telling you the truth. And you know what I've learned in my years of ministry for the Lord? You can't make people do anything either. You just can't make them do anything. They're going to do what they want to do. They're going to do what they want to do. That's the truth. Why is that? Because human beings, when they were created in the image and likeness of God, they are spirit, and when God created them, he gave them sovereignty over their space. Well, I see some recovery in that. I see some boundaries in that. He gave them sovereignty over their space. Proof of this is when he put them in the Garden of Eden, he said, you can eat of all those trees over there. Eat till you're full. Till you throw up. I don't care, but don't eat from this tree right here. Just don't. You can have all of that. Blessings, food. Everything. Just don't eat this. Now, if I was God, I wouldn't have put the tree in the garden in the first place. <laughs> and if I had to put it in the garden, I would have put an electric fence all the way around it. <laughs> so every time they got close, they got shocked. I would not have let them be able to do that to create what they happened to us these days. I'd have been like, no, we ain't doing that. Because he's all knowing, he's all powerful. 
But God didn't do that because when he created you in his image and likeness and his essence, you are a spirit and spirits have sovereignty. In order for you to be like him, he has to give you the same ability, which is choice. Free moral agency. It amazes me how many of you guys don't ever think about that kind of stuff. How God, God didn't stop that? How come God didn't stop me from getting addicted? Why didn't God stop me before I did that stupid thing? He's all powerful. He's all knowing. How come I had to go through what I went through? Why couldn't we just went directly into the promised land? Make me a Pentecostal preacher. Oh no, I had to go all that way to get where I'm at today. And what it did for me is I don't judge anybody because I can't judge you. That's for sure. I can't judge you. Where did evil come from? So a few months ago, we talked about darkness. We talked about darkness is the absence of light. Darkness of evil is a result of disobedience. Disobedience to the promise that's over your life. Well, how, how do you say that, Pastor Chris? Well, he says, if you eat of this and don't eat of that, you'll live in harmony with nature. Sin will never touch your life. The earth will never degrade, and you will not have to deal with global warming. But Adam and Eve, the sovereignty, if you do this over here and make this decision because you're sovereign, and even though I am God and I created the heavens and the earth, we're sovereign, so we have choice. He made the heaven and the earth perfect. Can I tell you, he did not make you perfect but he made you perfectly innocent. Help me, Lord. Can I teach you something here today? He did not make Adam and Eve perfect. He made them perfectly innocent. If they were perfect, they would not have had the capacity to disobey. When a baby is born, they're not perfect. They're perfectly innocent. Now, now you as the parent or the grandparent... You might think they're perfect, but somebody else might like, ah, oh, not so much. <laughs> but they are created perfectly innocent until the age of accountability. And we all know when that is, teenager. <laughs> Things change, amen? amen? So when God created Adam and Eve, they were not perfect. He created them perfectly innocent with sovereignty that gave them the ability to choose or not to choose. They chose to lean towards disobedience. So when we say the promises of God are yes and amen, yes is God's part. God has already made up his mind of what he wanted Adam and Eve to do in the garden and the destiny over their life. But they needed to come in agreement with that purpose. They need to come in agreement with that purpose. Can I get the altar team to come up? Those are spiritual. You're going to catch this one. Have you stayed with me so far? We are God. We are people of purpose. So not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that, when I come into the next sermon, this is where we're going to start. Are you okay with that? You can put it on the board. You can be coerced to be compliant but you cannot be forced to submit. I can preach a really positive message and a real funny message, and we can play really great worship music, and we can really set the stage for you real good. And we, we can coerce you to be compliant. Yeah, I'm going to show up at church. Church is great. I love church. Makes me feel good. They say the right things. We can coerce you to be compliant. As many churches have in the past years. 
but you can't be forced to submit. What do you mean, Pastor Chris? That's one of your crazy things out there. We just don't get what you say, okay? I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make him drink. I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make him drink. I can preach till my face turns red, as it usually does. But I can't make you submit. And God knows this about you. He created you that way. Only you can submit. Only you can make a decision to serve him or to not serve him. To live in the kingdom or not live in the kingdom. To serve him or to not serve him. My son-in-law, who's a great young man, was in jail and he said a prayer. As we most of us have. He said a prayer, you know, Lord, come into my life. And the moment he got out, nothing in his life changed except for the fact that every time he did something stupid, got loaded, he got caught. He even drove like three blocks away, pulled over in a parking lot so he can get loaded. And while he was getting loaded, his boss walked by the car. We talked about this one day as we were hanging out together for the whole day. Not that God didn't design it that way. And I explained to him that when you said that prayer, you gave God permission to work in your life. And he began a, prophets, a, pro, a process of the promise that he's put on your life. I said, but there comes a day, if you want to step into the kingdom, where the promises are yes and in him, amen, you've got to submit your life to him. All of you, it takes the all of you, not just part of you. And we had great worship that night, and he was even sitting in the back row there where about Tracy is. And the power of God was manifesting itself. It was a Sunday night that we called the church unplugged because it was unplugged for sure. And the power of God went back there and touched his heart, and the first thing he wanted to do was run out the back door. He didn't know what he was feeling or what was going on. He just knew that he was feeling something, and so he started to head for the back door. And Don caught him at the back door and said, Oh, no, young man, you're going the other way. So Don brings him up here, and that day he committed his life to Christ. He said, I'll serve you. I'll go to church. I'll get a position. He hasn't missed church once since he made that submission to him. And his life in less than a year completely turned around. Completely, financially, physically, spiritually. I just went and had Thanksgiving at their house this Thursday, last Thursday. That's the Thanksgiving for me because three years ago, four years, five years ago, my daughter was strung out on heroin. Now I'm having dinner at her house. She too, as a pastor's daughter, had to come to a place in her life where she submitted herself. Most of us, all the PK kids think we're saved because of our parents. Our parents are preachers, so we must be saved. There comes a time when you have to make a just choice to submit yourself to him. And you have that choice. Maybe some of you in here today, you're in the desert. You're in the desert. Nothing's going right. You can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Every time you turn around, it's something, one thing after another. You know, you've lost, you've lost interest in your promise. You feel that God has left you. The devil has planted himself in there. You're beginning to backslide. Spiritual death is setting in. I'm here to tell you today that the promise of God are yes and in him, amen. And you need to submit yourself back to what God has called you to do that he created you to do. You need to make a decision today. I'm going to serve you no matter what. Some of you are here today and you're suffering with some kind of ailment. And you keep getting prayed for and prayed for and prayed for. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when we're wore out, God, we're just wore out. We're designed to wore out. You know what I mean? If it's physical, sometimes I believe, God, we have to work through it. If something's spiritual, God will deliver you from it immediately. Some of you here have made mistakes in your life and you feel like you've fallen short and God's never going to use you again. I'm here to tell you that's a lie from the devil. God has not changed his mind to what he's going to do with you. 
You might need to come and, and ask for forgiveness and repent or spend some time with him right here in the middle of this altar right here. But he hasn't changed his mind over your life. You might have let the devil come in and steal your promise and your expectations. But he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You might just need to get back and submit your life to what he wants to do for you today. And only you can do that. You have to make that decision. I'm going to follow you no matter what. Even though I can't see you. Take the story of Joseph. God gave him a vision. Then he was thrown in a pit. He was sold into slavery. He went into prison. Never once did he ever falter what God was going to do in his life. And at the end, that vision came to pass. His word came to pass. Some of you think the devil's beating you up. And maybe it's not the devil. So today, I'm just going to say it. This right here, this is a prepared atmosphere. God shows up to a prepared atmosphere. I've preached that sermon to you. I've shown you. He shows up to a prepared atmosphere. All he tells you to get a prayer closet. If you prepare it, he'll show up and sit there with you. This is prepared. This is prepared to those who want to come and have time with him personally. Nobody from the outside putting hands on him. None of the altar workers putting hands on them. This is the zone where you come that you get to meet with him. And the moment you guys step into here, you put yourself in his place. And this, I trust these 100%. These ministers, these altar ministers have stood the test of time. They speak in tongues. They're filled with the Spirit. They keep their mouth shut. They're completely trustful. They move under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They have been selected because it is prepared for you. That they can come and stand in between heaven and earth for on your behalf. Where two or more come together, I'm there in the midst. And where he is, there his power is. That means I don't want any of you to come up and put your hands on people past that row right there. I don't care how much the Holy Spirit unction you to go pray. Don't. Don't. Stand there and put your hands. He can work from a distance. We just said a prayer. A week ago, and it took two days for the guy to receive it, and God still faithfully. So if you're here today, and I can feel it happening already, my legs are beginning to shake. The presence of God is in this altar. If you're here today, and you feel like there's something more, you need something more, and you need to spend some time with him in between. Maybe he needs to talk to you personally. You come right here while we worship. we got about another 15 minutes of worship going to happen. You come communicate with him personally. If it's deeper than that, if it's deeper than that, come to one of the altar workers on the side here and allow him to pray for you. It's ridiculous for you to leave here with anything that you came in here with. God is here to answer you. His promises are yes and amen. And in him, amen. So for the next 15 minutes, this is all about you and him, as I told you. There's more to come, and I want to thank you for letting me preach.